Hi, everybody, and welcome to this eLife Symposium on Computational and Systems Biology. Uh, my name is Alexandra Walczak. I'm a senior editor at eLife. Uh, and we're here to sort of try and showcase a little bit some really exciting work that's been going on in some sub areas of computational and systems biology. So of course, this is this this is not. I mean, even saying it's a huge field is a terrible understatement, because uh, these couple of words encompass essentially all fields of biology, from neuroscience to evolution, uh, from behavior to metabolism and everything else I haven't mentioned, uh, but share more of a common approach to how people uh, approach problems in biology and try and find answers, uh, both using theoretical computational data analysis, but also experimental approaches. So uh, there's going, we're going to have four talks today that hopefully will be, well, that, that I know will be very exciting, but I just want to say that in no way does this cover the breadth of this field. And there's plenty of stuff that will not be covered also on the technical side, such as image analysis, uh, pure machine learning, to name a few, sequence analysis, genomics data. And I just want to say that by no means does it mean that this is not part of this field. We just had to make some very hard choices. So uh, with that, let me introduce our speakers today. Uh, Gaudem Reddy, uh, Kanaka Rajan, Eric Van Nijwegen, and Ellen Morlom. Uh, and they'll be covering fields from behavior, neuroscience, gene regulation, and biodiversity. And uh, hopefully they'll be showing us how we can actually go from a biological problem through data with theoretical ideas and computational approaches to answer these biological problems. There are some participation guidelines. We want everyone to enjoy the uh, symposium, uh, but we want everybody to sort of behave in a way that they would behave in any other circumstances. So if you want to find out more about that, you can uh, read about it. Uh, the questions will be at the end of all the talks. So please post questions as you're listening to the talks as they come to your mind, but we'll be asking them collectively after the four talks. So hang around for the end. Uh, and if you have any problems during uh, the, 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 the symposium, please email an eLive member such as Maria Guerrero, who's here, or, or Shane Alston. And uh, so without... Further to do, let's uh, move on to the first talk. So let me stop sharing. And uh, Gaudem, uh, so Gaudem Reddy is our first speaker and he's going to talk uh, to us about odor tracking. So uh, take it away. Thank you, Alexander. And I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing the symposium. I hope you can see the slides and the pointer here. Um, so I'll, I'll get right into it. Uh, this, this talk is going to be about how animals track odor trails. So what I mean by this is about uh, um, how animals track surface-borne odor trails, like the kind that you would expect dogs, ants, or rodents to track. So for example, here you see this beautiful um, photograph, a long exposure shot of a dog tracking a pheasant trail. So basically this bird has been dragged along this yellow line, and you can see, see the dog zigzagging around it. Right, and that's what we want to understand. The goal for this talk is just to give a flavor of what theory can offer in answering questions of this sort, behavioral questions. Most of the details are in this preprint over here. And this is joint work uh, with Boris Schreiman and KATP and Massimo Vergasola at Equal Normal Paris. Right, so what do we know? Right? So it turns out that we know quite a bit about trail tracking, and this comes from uh, training dogs to track trails and so on. But we know surprisingly little in terms of actual scientific experiments. And what little we know comes from experiments with ants and rodents, essentially. So what you're seeing here is, is a video of an ant tracking a pheromone trail. This is happening in the dark, so the ant has to use its antenna to track the trail. 
And what one can do uh, using these videos is to use uh, some kind of deep learning methods to extract the body movements over time. And uh, that's what you see below here. You're seeing the two antenna, the body and the trail in black. And as you can see here, the, the ant is really good at tracking this trail, right? It's pretty much right on the trail. And it, it's not using some random strategy. It's actually using some, some, some crisscross uh, sampling strategy here. It's alternating between using its left antenna and its right antenna. And we don't really know what exactly it's doing there. One can do similar experiments with rats. Um, so uh, this is an experiment from Upinder Bala's group uh, back in 2012. Uh, and the idea here is that you have a rat on a treadmill well, whose speed is controlled, and you have a person drawing a trail by hand. This is a chocolate trail, and the, the rats are trained to follow these chocolate trails. And you record the ant and the trail at the same time. And over the course of days, the, rant, the rats get pretty good at it. They're able to track the trail, as you can see here. And, and you see some interesting behavior. So for instance, if you break these trails, uh, the rats uh, still track the trail, but they tend to exhibit uh, these uh, casting trajectories, right? these oscillatory zigzag trajectories that incre of increasing amplitude. And I'll get back to these uh, trajectories later on. Now, regardless of what the ants are doing here or the rat is doing here, um, any kind of trail tracking strategy should involve um, the should uh, require the animal to continuously reorient itself along the trail based on its past experience. And this kind of team or, or, or decision-making problem is quite common to uh, many behavioral problems which involve solving a task, right? So typically what you have is that you have some sensory input, you have the animal's self-motion cues. These are being transformed in some way. It's a black box we don't know and we would like to find out. These, but these are being transformed into some decision that the animal takes. And this decision, again, feeds back on the input, right? So there, there's some kind of active feedback control going on here. Now, of course, this, this black box is going to be informed by whatever physical or computational constraints that this animal is experiencing. So we'd like to understand both the black box as well as these constraints and the sensory input that is most useful for the animal to perform this task. I mean, trail tracking in principle could be arbitrarily complicated. But the issue here is that uh, you have a very long history dependence the, the, the decision-making strategy of the animal in principle can depend on the entire history of the animal, but we are going to try and simplify this problem into its basic elements and hopefully identify some general principles here. Right, so if you dig deeper into the problem, as I was saying, what you'd like to do is to follow the trail, right? So you want to figure out where the trail is headed. And, and the simplest way of doing that is to um, interpolate uh, given that you have two points. So you can't do it with one point, of course, because you have to interpolate a line and you can do it with more, but two is the simplest version, right? So what do you get when you have two? When you have two, um, a clear solution is that uh, the trail is most likely headed along the line joining these two points. But of course, it's not just a line joining these two points, you also have some uncertainty. And this comes from the fact the trails curve, right? So the trails are not always straight. They can curve, they can break. And so you have the most likely heading and you, and you have some uncertainty. So, and this forms some kind of sector, right? It forms an angular sector. Uh, to, to give an analogy, the, you can think of this as, as if you're walking in the woods and you see, you see a curved trail over here and you can't see beyond that. And someone asks you to extrapolate where the trail is headed, right? So of course you would say that it's most likely headed along this direction, but there's some uncertainty because the trail could curve. And that's the idea here. But what this suggests is that uh, you can break down uh, this presumably complex trail tracking problem into simpler parts. The idea is that uh, every time you make contact with the trail, you immediately lose contact with it. Now you search and try to reestablish contact with the trail as you're seeing here. So you, you execute some kind of trajectory and establish re-establish contact with the trail, and then you repeat this process, right? So you can break down the, the full problem into these uh, smaller chunks, and each, each chunk is a search task. So in this, in this reduced uh, framework, in the simplified framework, we can ask more specific questions. So for instance, we can ask, how should the animal sample in order to re-establish contact with the trail? We can ask if there are limits on how fast an animal can track a trail, right? And of course, there, there are going to be limits because you can't track infinitely fast if the trail is curving. So there's a relationship between trail geometry and speed. And the third question, which is relevant for animals, is how do you integrate past information, right? So how do you take into account all the history of detections that you made? 
I won't focus on the speed um, in this in, in the time that we have. I'll, I'll briefly touch on the first and the third questions here. So to answer the first question, um, we're going to use something known as the reinforcement learning framework. Uh, it's been developed uh, maybe 30 years ago in computer science, inspired by neuroscience, of course. And the idea of reinforcement learning is that it, it, it provides algorithms to solve the feedback control problem that I said before. So the idea is that you have an agent which interacts with its environment by taking certain actions. Every time it takes an action, gets an observation back from the environment, and it also gets a reward. And this loop forms a perception action cycle. So this, this generates behavior. And the animals simply choose the actions that maximize some, some kind of long-term reward that is specified um, externally. Right? So in the trail tracking problem, for instance, uh, what we're going to do is, is simply to ask uh, the animal to reestablish contact with the trail once it has lost it. And we're going to give, give it a reward whenever it finds a trail again. So what you're going to see here are the trajectories that come out of this learning simulation. And uh, the animal is going to, the agent is going to start from the origin. And you have to imagine that it's, it's going to go from left to right. And you have to imagine that the trail is somewhere um, along a cone within this region. And the distribution of the angles is given by this uh, prior distribution. Right? So you're going to see the trajectory in blue. And this is the learned trajectory, the, the unlearned trajectory at the knee initially is completely random, it just wanders off. But as you can see here, um, the, the agent learns to perform uh, these oscillations. And you can see that the, the, the posterior turns into a bimodal distribution, which shifts between a left and right. And these oscillations persist until, until the agent finds the trail. Um, you can do something similar. So the real power of reinforcement learning is that it's completely model free. Right, so, so how you do it is that you set up your simulation, you give it some reward whenever it succeeds, and, and you just run it for many trials. Right? So it, you, you're not giving it a lot of your own uh, uh, structure to the problem, and it's, it's able to learn new strategies. So you can, you can do the same thing with uh, not a single sensor, but two sensors similar to an ant, right? and that's what you would see here. And as you can see, that the trajectory is quite different from, uh, from the single sensor case. Instead of the oscillations, what you see is this crisscrossing uh, strategy. And if you, if you stitch these trajectories together on, on, real, on an actual uh, simulated trail, um, you, you kind of concatenate all these uh, uh, subunits. Uh, you, you can see that it qualitatively reproduces uh, the kind of behavior that we saw in experiments, right? So for the single sensor case, uh, it fo follows the trail over here. It's pretty much exactly on the trail. And once it loses the trail, it performs this casting uh, trajectory. And in the case of two sensors, it's going to alternatively use its left sensor and its right sensor. The intuition behind this uh, strategy is that um, it, it's quite simple, right? So you have a sector. Uh, you have to search over some angular space. And it turns out that the, the, the most efficient way of searching over this angular space and going forward at the same time the single sensor is to do this casting motion, and the two sensors is to do this crisscrossing sampling motion. And this kind of rationalizes the behaviors that we saw. So, I mean, I'm going, not going to go into the uh, details of how past information is integrated, but one can potentially ask uh, if you have multiple contacts with the trail, how do you integrate this information in order to find uh, where the trail is headed? Um, you can use ideas from statistical physics to do it. And, and the idea is that you have a stochastic model of the paths that would go through these various points. And, and the, key, the key point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, when we write down these models, we get an effective uh, description of what the sector looks like, given, given the distance between points of contact and the history of what the animal is detected. And so this is going to inform how the animal behaves, which we can measure experimentally. And this will tell us something about what the animal is actually doing. And I'd like to end by saying that uh, um, the, the, a little bit about the general approach here, um, which I think is relevant for behavior because it's much easier to collect data than to, uh, than to interpret the data. Um, so if we, if we can split the problem into uh, what is the problem, uh, what is the solution to the problem, and how is the solution implemented, uh, we are square in the first two uh, places, the computational and the algorithmic aspects. And what we'd like to do is to build theories to, to explain the computational and the algorithmic aspects of behavior and hopefully uh, generate some feedback with experiments and ultimately figure out uh, what neural circuits actually implement these algorithms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gautam. Kanaka, would you like to share your screen?
Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I will um, try to conclude on time, but please. Okay. Do sorry, I actually forgot to introduce you. Yeah, but uh, that way, our uh -huh. next speaker is Kanakarajan, and we're going to move him more into neuroscience with neurons this time. Okay. Okay. So, uh -huh. All right. Yeah. No worries. Thank you for um, having me. I understand that you know many of us haven't done these ten-minute talks since our uh, lapsed physics days. So um, I will do my best. All right. So in life, when we're evaluating actions and Gautam set me up perfectly for this, right? We evaluate whether those actions are worth the effort or not. So if actions are repeatedly fruitless, ultimately you become kind of dejected, right? And in the extreme, this can manifest as hopelessness or sometimes also um, known as learned helplessness in the depression literature in the extreme. Um, this kind of phenomenon is seen in many nervous systems and um, it's, it's, it involves essentially a response to persistent and inescapable stress as perceived by the animal. So it's seen in smaller nervous systems like the larval zebra fish or larger nervous systems like the mouse, the rats, humans, everywhere, right? So one of the questions that as theorists we can ask is, are there any circuit mechanisms that are conserved when you go from these smaller nervous systems to larger nervous systems, as well as identify key divergences? But, you know, one of the ways that we approach such a problem is to build computational models. And in my lab, we build neural network models that are constrained directly by experimental data. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, we analyze or reverse engineer these models that have been built constrained to data. And the idea here is to infer circuit mechanisms that are inaccessible for measurements alone. So let's look at one of these examples, um, examples in detail. I've written a few papers on the subject. And so you can always ask me something at the end if you like. So the experiment I'm going to be talking about today involves larval zebra fish um, in Carl Dizerot's lab. It's an ongoing collaboration of my lab and Carl Dizerot's lab. So all the data I'll be presenting were collected there. So larval zebra fish are exposed to stress over a prolonged period of time. I'm talking about half an hour. And when the stress first comes on, and these are very mild electric shocks, the fish whip their tails trying to get away. But their head fits, so they can't get away. And it's an open loop experiment. So they you know, there's no correlation between their escape movement and the shocks coming in. So eventually fish go from active coping to the state that you saw in the cartoon before where they stop struggling entirely. And that phase transition is going from active coping to passive coping. And I've quantified that here for you. In blue is the shocked fish um, tail whips as a function of time. And in black is the control fish. And you can see those two sort of epochs playing out in this gray, in this pink bar here. There's an active coping phase which involves an increase in this vigorous evasive movement, followed by something where it decreases below the control state. Now, the Dizeroth lab is essentially an expert monitoring brain-wide activity, and so that's what they end up doing in the larval zebrafish system. So different neurons in the brain of the fish, in fact, the whole brain we have access to, um, they record activity from this over this entire half hour, 45 minute experiment. So of course, this begs the question, well, what actually happens in this neural activity that caused the behavioral transition that you see both in the cartoon and in the quantification on the left of this, left of this movie? So we're returning to our um, approach, right? We're going to answer the question, what brain-wide mechanism mediates active to passive coping in larval zebrafish using our idea of building neural network models constrained by data? So the first thing we do is to go from single region, recurrent neural network models. So when I refer to RNNs in this talk, I'm talking about recurrent neural networks where neurons connect to one another bidirectionally. There's feed forward and feedback connections. And the only thing we do here is to wire multiple ones together, one for each area in the larval zebrafish brain we're talking about. And it's, it, these types of models are simple and interesting because they have a mathematically tractable um, parameter set that that, that controls how they behave. So in the single module RNN, it's this matrix of connectivity or variously known as directed interactions. In the multi-region case, this interaction matrix has an interesting shape because it now has it could have block diagonal structure with within area connections going down the principal diagonal and across area interactions going in the, in the various subblocks. And this is a feature we'll return to in a second. The second thing we do, as I hinted to in the beginning of my talk, is to train the activity of each unit, the activation of each unit directly to match experimental data. So it's not this realistic plasticity mechanism or anything. It's a trick to get these types of artificial systems to behave like the neural system. 
So this, these are the two things we do. And what are the outputs we get from such a mechanism, right? We get a multi-region RNN that once it's trained, every unit in it behaves exactly like the experimental data it was trained to match. This by itself is not super surprising for people that work with neural networks like this. They know universal approximation and they figure out that this is not that surprising. The surprising thing is our ability to infer from these matrices, from these, the matrices that give you the interactions within and across regions through these, through the, th by reverse engineering these trained models. Finally, and this is the thing I'm going to tell you about in the next slide, is the, the product of, of those two objects gives you currents due to recurrence, both within and across areas. Now, these last two things are quantities that you cannot get from measurements alone. And that's what the power of these types of models is. They provide a, a platform for us to better leverage existing data and to be able to design experiments um, based on testing predictions made by these models. So let's look at the third one in detail, right? Fitting these types of models to time-varying data gives us this matrix where across the diagonal are the within area connections or, or directionality, magnitude, and type of interactions. And across our connections, for example, from region A to region, region B to region A, region C to region A. Now, the dot product of those two objects gives you currents due to recurrence. And that's why we call this process current-based decomposition or CURB for short. So that's what we end up doing in the larval zebrafish system. And I'm going to show you an example of we've done this in the whole brain and we're analyzing those, uh, those trained networks now. But we build a three region model, which I'm going to show you today. One that looks like the habenula, one that looks like the raphe, and one that looks like the telencephalon. So these are three regions in the larval zebrafish system that are known to be historically known to be mediating this type of behavior. And this is inherited from mouse literature where a lot of this work has been done previously. So we're doing exactly the same exercise as I told you before. We're training every unit in this model to match data collected from the respective region. And from that, we infer this connectivity matrix. The product of those two objects should give you currents. Now, based on how you actually do the dot product, you can get currents within a region as well as across regions. And so what we're going to do now is to decompose the activity of the habenula into these component currents. And now instead of this one n by time matrix giving you outputs in the habenula, you can look at the sources of this activity decomposed into within habenular interactions and, can interact and currents that result in the habenular activity that are inherited from the raphe, as well as currents that are inherited from its interactions with the telencephalon. So essentially, by doing this decomposition, you get one within area current and two between area curves, which you could not have gotten from measurements alone because you needed the matrix, which came from fitting the RNNs in the first place. Right now, now that you've decomposed this n by time matrix into three of them, right, the sum of these three still gives you the recorded output. But now you can do dimensionality reduction or state space analysis in the current space. And so that's what I do here. Now I'm get, deriving a coordinate axis by just doing principal components on, on these three currents. And that gives you this coordinate axis system with habenula to habenula currents in blue, raphe to habenula currents in red, and telencephalon to habenula currents in yellow. Then I take the recorded outputs and project them into this new coordinate space. In addition, I put the timing of the, of the various electric shocks that are given to the fish on it as dots. Now, the warm colors are early part of the experiment, which is supposed to correspond to an increase in the activity of the habenula. And later on, is later shocks are in cold colors. What we see here is a separation of time scales. So you see that rather than activity being concentrated within the habenula, it's actually early part of the shocks or active coping is mediated by rotations in the current space external to the habenula, specifically from the raphe into the habenula. And it's only later on that the habenula to habenula and telencephalon to habenula currents come on. And so this kind of point of view gives us something that the traditional point of view doesn't. But, you know, I was taught never to trust a 3D plot. So let me show you what these things look like um, as a function of time. So on top, you see the activity derived from uh, the this exact same analysis over time for control fish. This is models that have been fit to individual fish that have not gotten shocks. So there's two sources of variability here. First, in the initialization of these matrices, and two, 
two across individuals. Now in black is the tail whips, which have made into a continuous trace just to give your eyes something to look at. In blue is habenula to habenula current, in yellow telencephalon to habenula, and in red raphe to habenula. In control fish, the three currents seem to mirror one another. But if you look at the exact same plot for the shocked fish, you observe two things. One is that the movement in black goes up and then goes down to zero, indicating the active to passive coping transition, as we expect. But here, there's an early ramp that is driven by the raffe to habenula currents. And it's only later on that the habenula to habenula and telencephalon to habenula currents um, start to ramp up. This is conserved across individuals. And we're now probing this through causal experiments in our collaboration with. Uh, so the prediction here is if you eliminate this current, passive coping should be either delayed or eliminated. So this is the kind of prediction that, uh, that a study like this can make for you. Right, Naka, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. We really need to wrap up and move on to the next. We're really done. So okay. this basically is something that we're, uh, we're now uh, trying to publish as a powerful alternative to the traditional point of view of looking at neural activity, which is looking at neural activity and correlating it with behavior, sorting neural activity, averaging neural activity, or in fact, looking at activity in the principal component space. So this type of decomposition is a much more powerful alternative, or at least a complement to the traditional point of view. That is all we wanted to say here. And this is just conclusions. And with that, I would like to say thank you um, for having me and to our funding sources for their support of our ideas. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kanaka. Uh -huh. So uh, let's move on to our next speaker, Eric van Nemegen, if you could share your screen. And uh, we're severely shifting topic now to gene regulation. Thanks, Alexandra. So thanks a lot um, for inviting me to take part in this. I would like to start my talk by reminding you that uh, gene regulatory networks are in a sense responsible for the intelligence of cells. They allow microbes to respond to changing environments and adapt to them. They allow multicellular organisms to express a single genome into a sort of society of diverse genotypes. And uh, for 20 years now, we've also known that in bacteria, the regulatory capacity is, is growing quadratically with the size of the genome. So the bigger the genome gets, the bigger the fraction of the genome that is uh, devoted to these regulatory networks. The question I want to focus on today is how does gene regulation evolve the novel? So typically in bacteria, um, a transcription factor responds to some external signal and then up or down regulates a set of target genes by the appropriate amounts depending on the strength of the signal. But if you think about it, it seems that quite some things would have to happen in parallel in order to evolve such regulation de novo, right? So you need a regulatory protein to become responsible, responsive to the strength of a particular signal. And then all the appropriate target genes have to evolve binding sites for this regulator, and no other genes should. And then you also have to tune the strength of these target regulator interactions to lead to the appropriate induction levels. So you may ask, how does evolution accomplish this so, so readily? And I want to share with you some insights that I think we, we gained about this question from actually analysis of gene expression noise in E. coli. So for about uh, a decade or so, people now have been using fluorescent reporters uh, where you stick a promoter sequence in front of a fluorescent gene, either on a plasmid or on the chromosome, in combination with either uh, flow cytometry, this is what we used, or microscopy, to essentially measure single cell distributions of, of genes on a genome-wide scale. And here is an example. I show you that what you get from most genes is that the log expression is roughly Gaussian distributed so that you can characterize the expression distribution for a single gene by the mean and the variance in log expression that you observe. All right, now in this plot here, all the black dots correspond to native promoters from E. coli, where along the x-axis is the mean expression and around the y-axis is the noise of all these native promoters. Now, in this project, what we did is that we evolved 
random uh, synthetic promoters by essentially taking a large library of random sequences of about 100 to 150 base pairs long and screen from them those short sequences that drive expression at similar levels as for native Ebola genes. And to a surprise, what we observed is that the noise levels of the synthetic promoters that I'm showing you here in red are generally lower than the noise levels of native promoters. Now, we know that these synthetic promoters were not selected for their noise properties. So what this shows is that if you just take random sequences that express an E. coli, their default behavior is to have low noise. This means that these noisy promo native promoters that we see must have been under some pressure of natural selection that increased their noise levels. So this raises the question, what is special about these native promoters that are noisy? And to make a long story short, what we found is that the more noisy a promoter is, the more regulatory inputs it tends to have. So here we've sorted promoters from low to high noise. And you see, as you go to promoters that are higher and higher noise, the average number of regulatory inputs that these promoters have, as known in the literature, is increasing systematically. Now, our interpretation of this is that the noise in these native promoters comes from propagation of noise from regulators to their targets, so that the noise of a gene, in a sense, reflects how noisy the regulators are that regulate this gene. Now, this raises the next question. Why is it like that? Is it that this is just an unavoidable cost of gene regulation and that cells don't like this noise, but they just cannot avoid it? Or is there maybe an evolutionary benefit to this noise propagation? So to look at that, we developed a general theory of how this noise propagation affects uh, fitness of genes that are asked to do certain gene regulation. So to give you a flavor of this theory, this cartoon um, tries to show you what uh, happens when you couple a gene to a regulator. So we're imagining that uh, cells undergo three environments, here a red, a gold, and a green environment. And these little shaded regions show you that in order to survive and grow in the red environment, the gene has to express in this range, in the gold environment in this range, and in the green environment in that range. Now, if you start with some gene that is without regulation, it might have a, a expression distribution across single cells that look like the blue distribution. And this shows you that in the gold condition, uh, this gene is doing very well because uh, its distribution of expression levels asks um, overlaps well with what the environment asks. But in the green and uh, red conditions, uh, it's very bad and uh, this organism will not survive because none of its cells are expressing at the appropriate level. Now, ideally, there would be a transcription factor in the genome that was upregulated in the green condition and downregulated in the red condition. And if now this gene evolves a binding site for this regulator, its expression in these different conditions will look like that, and its fitness will be much increased. Now, what is important to realize is that the effect of coupling the regulator to the target has two effects here. First, there is the condition response that means that the mean of the target becomes dependent on the mean of the regulator that regulates it. And this is, of course, how one normally thinks about gene regulation. But second, because the regulator itself has some noise in each environment, that noise is propagated to the target, who by this effect increases its noise. So we worked out a general theory how this affects the fitness of coupling a regulator to a gene. And it turns out that under some fairly weak assumptions, you can show that it only de depends on four effective parameters. One is the variation in the desired levels of the target gene. So sort of it's a measure of un how unhappy the unregulated gene is. Second, the signal to noise in the regulator, how much the regulator varies across conditions versus how noisy it is in each condition how well the levels of the regulator correlate with the desired levels of the targets in each condition, and finally, the coupling strength. And in terms of these, you can really get an analytic expression of the fitness effect of coupling a regulator to a target. 
So to explain to you what this does, this shows you what would happen if you take an unregulated gene that starts out quite unhappy and couple it, couple it to a regulator as a function of how noisy the regulator is, so from low signal to noise to high signal to noise, and how well the expression levels of the regulator across conditions match with the desires that this target gene has, going from no correlation at all to perfect correlation. Now, obviously, the best you can have is if you find a transcription factor that has high signal to noise and that almost perfectly correlates with the desires of this target gene. If you couple to such a transcription factor, you will have the highest possible fitness. And basically, this is the standard condition response effect, right? That the regulator is pushing the target up precisely the way it wants. But if you take instead a regulator that is very high noise and that doesn't correlate at all with the desires of the target, you find that you also much increase the fitness for this target gene. But here, the origin of this increase in fitness is not regulation in a normal sense. Basically, the target gene uses the regulator as a source of noise to implement a bet hedging strategy that already makes its fitness much better. But the crucial insight is now that there is a continuum of solutions that interpolates between these regulatory strategies. So there is an essential, you can have regulatory strategies anywhere in this plane that combine this condition dependence with noise propagation. And so this line here shows you the sort of optimal combinations of noise propagation and, co and uh, condition dependence so that um, you can start your gene regulation by coupling to a regulator that only increases your noise. And this- Can you wrap up, Eric? Yes. Time's up. Okay. So um, to summarize what I've tried to show you, um, we showed that noise propagation is functional, can act as a rudimentary form of regulation. It allows regulatory strategies that smoothly interpretate between signal and noise. And it allows a crude regulator to combine it with noise propagation to obtain fitness to it that is close to the optimum that you could um, achieve. And it looks like E. coli is implementing such noisy regulatory strategies. All right, thank you very much. So thanks so much. And let's move on to our last speaker, Hélène Morlon. So Hélène will be talking about biodiversity. Yes, thank you. Thank you for organizing this and for having me here and giving me the opportunity to present some of the research we're doing in my uh, group where we develop uh, computational approaches for understanding the deep time evolution of biodiversity. Um, if I can move on my slides. Not, uh, um, so um, we're interested in understanding how um, biological diversity evolved on geological timescales to explain patterns of species and phenotypic richness as we see them around us today. And so to give uh, specific examples, we're interested in, in of big overarching questions. We're interested in understanding why species group are more species rich than others, why some regions of the planet are more species rich than others, uh, and why phenotypic diversity is um, richer in um, some species, species group than others. Um, the um, overarching approach that we have to address this question is to develop stochastic models. And there are two types of stochastic, stochastic models that we're developing and um, that other people in the field um, develop. Uh, and to give you the, uh, an easy example with the simplest model we can think about, um, a model of um, birth death model of um, diversification, where we have constant rates of speciation and extinction. So the underlying process is just the process of a plate um, that starts with an ancestral lineage and diversify with um, given decision rate lambda, extension rate mu. Um, and we can develop um, a statistical approaches to adjust these types of models to uh, phylogenetic data. So data of phylogenies uh, representing the um, relationship between an um, extant species. And the type of results we get um, are um, uh, parameters um, that are bi bi biologically relevant and interesting for us, such as rates of speciation and extinction. And by comparing different types of these models, we can also compare their relative statistical support. And so um, in the end, get an understanding of or, um, or um, an ability to compare different modes and tempo of species diversification. Um, same principle. Um, 
same principle um, to study how um, phenotypes um, evolve to produce current patterns of phenotypic diversity. Uh, we can use um, models, if we think about um, models for uh, modeling uh, quantitative traits, we can use stochastic diffusion models where we have diffusion processes that run on phylogenetic trees. Um, so same thing, but it's, it's, it's one of the simplest example of a Brownian process that we're going to run on a phylogenetic tree. Um, that is determined by, by the diffusion coefficient uh, sigma. If we can adjust uh, this model to uh, data, which is, in this case is data that combines the phylogenetic relationship between extant species and their phenotypes that we can characterize um, today, uh, we um, can get at estimates um, such as um, the, the diffusion rate that we can interpret as a rate of phenotypic evolution and we can compare the support of different types of models and get some conclusions or um, some ideas on uh, which modes or um, uh, tempo of phenotypic evolution are the most, uh, most likely to have occurred um, given the data that we observe today. So what I did, because this is uh, obviously a pretty um, 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 broad uh, field, is to um, showcase a couple of examples um, of um, uh, models that we can develop and applications to data um, to show you the type of um, uh, answer or questions that we can address in uh, macroevolution. Um, so if we uh, develop models where rates of decision and extinction can vary through time, we can try to get an idea of how these rates um, change through time um, and potentially have um, an estimate of how uh, species richness uh, varied um, in the deep past from um, uh, data from um, extant species. So here, for example, applying these um, approaches to the Cetacean phylogeny, we see a, clay, a case of a clade where speciation rate might have declined through time and extension rate have been constant through time. And another case where um, the opposite occurs, where a speciation rate might have been constant through time and extension rate decreased through time, uh, generating patterns of um, increase in diversity um, over geological time and then uh, declining diversity and that have also been observed um, in the fossil record. Helen, may I just ask you if you could speak a little bit louder, please? Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank sorry. you. I hope I hope you you could hear so far. Yeah. Um, I wonder if my volume maybe is not um, high enough. Is that better like this? Yeah, if you could just try to speak a little bit louder. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so um, same thing. If this time we uh, try to develop models uh, where uh, rates vary across lineages, not only for time but across lineages. So here it's an example uh, where at each speciation event we are going to have a model where we draw a new speciation rate in a distribution that is centered on the ancestral rate with a potential temporal trend um, and um, a variance given by. A, uh, another parameter that controls uh, how irritable the traits are. So no sigma values are going to um, model uh, speciation rates that are uh, very irritable uh, across um, uh, lineages and um, large sigma values, some that um, are much more labile. Uh, we can also um, develop inference machineries that allow to estimate uh, the hyperparameters of the model, which control, which are going to give an example or, or an idea of the um, overall uh, trend in diversification rate through time and of the variability of the irritability of the rate across lineages. And we can also get um, uh, estimates of speciation rate for each branch um, in the phylogenetic tree. And what we've been able uh, to show using this model and um, adjusting it to the um, the bird radiation uh, is that there can be several orders of magnitude difference in speciation rates across lineages, even in pretty uh, constrained um, uh, taxonomy groups. And what these types of approaches can be useful for is also um, to try to understand not only like to quantify how these rates vary across um, a phylogenetic tree, but also what drives these variations. So we can try to uh, find correlates um, of diversification rates with um, a lot of different measures, for example, ecological characteristic of the species or biogeogra bi biogeographical characteristic of the species. Uh, here is an example where we uh, looked whether we could uh, find um, an association between um, species level genetic diversity and speciation rate. Uh, with a pre an a priori expectation that we might um, have a positive uh, relationship uh, whereby uh, we need um, uh, genetic diversity as material for speciation rates um, to, uh, to, to occur. Uh, what we see here um, is um, the opposite uh, trend where we found a consistent, consistent negative association between genetic diversity and speciation rates across mammals. 
um, which um, we interpret has um, an effect of um, uh, the fast diversification of lineages, uh, limiting the amount of genetic diversity that can be accumulated uh, within species uh, rather than an effect of genetic diversity on species rates. Um, we can also um, develop models where we can um, uh, link uh, past speciation and extension rates to past variations um, of, um, um, of the, in the environment. So, for example, past uh, temperature that, um, that uh, well, for which we can get um, estimates. Um, and so, um, what we have found uh, using these, uh, these models on empirical data. Uh, for example, in body size evolution, we have found uh, faster rates of body size evolution under cold climatic periods uh, across uh, birds and mammals. Um, and we have found um, uh, in diatoms um, pretty contrasting contract eff effects of uh, different environments and, and different um, diatom groups, uh, where uh, the main uh, environmental driver of diversification is going to vary across groups and potentially also the direction uh, of uh, this effect um, can vary also. Uh, another uh, a class of model uh, that we have been uh, pushing forward are models uh, where we can, um, that allow us to test uh, the potential effect of interspecific interaction on um, diversification and trait evolution. Um, and the type of results we can get here, so um, two examples again, uh, one example where we tested um, um, the strength of interspecific competition in traits that are used um, um, in particular uh, for uh, resource use versus traits that are involved more in social interaction, uh, where we found a stronger uh, effect of interspecific interaction on trait evolution uh, for traits that are involved in resource use. And also um, on, on the right, um, uh, where we tested uh, this time, the effect, um, how the effect of competition uh, vary with latitudes with um, an hypothesis that has been put forward for explanation for uh, species richness in the tropics, which is the, that species interactions are stronger in the tropics and um, tend to uh, spur diversification. Um, and uh, by um, testing these hypotheses using a bunch of models where um, uh, we are able to um, estimate the strength of um, interspecific interaction in tropical versus temperate lineages, uh, we uh, don't find uh, such an effect. Glenn, we, we need to wrap up when, whenever you can, please. Yes, um, this will be short. Uh, uh, last example uh, showing um, that um, these types of models on phenotypic evolution can be extended on high-dimensional uh, phenotypes, such as 3D morphometric um, uh, data. Uh, and uh, to wrap up, I will um, uh, just say that, yeah, it's, uh, there are these bunch of computational tools uh, um, based on stochastic models adjusted to phylogenetic and phenotypic data that allow us uh, to improve our understanding of how um, the biotic and biotic factors have shaped diversification and phenotypic evolution. Um, and we made these tools um, available to the community through, um, through packages and with that, I will just wrap up by thanking everybody and friendly resources. And thanks for listening. All right. Thank you very much, Ellen, and thank you very much to all the speakers for these very stimulating talks. So uh, let us now go into uh, the question session. Uh, the first question for Gautam, are there examples of animals where you can effectively remove a sensor and then show that the strategy shifts in a way predicted uh, by reinforcement learning? So the, the answer is yes for the first and no for the second question. So yes, uh, people have uh, clipped an antenna of an ant and it freaks out, but eventually it learns. But we haven't really tried that out uh, in our own. All right, thank you. So next question for Kanaka. Uh, how do you know that this problem is identifiable? that you cannot get equally well-fitting models that have very different direct interactions between regions? So it is totally, so this thing has the contravariance question that I think this may be, um, yeah, biophysicist asking a question like this one. But um, so 
there, so the more data we have to constrain these models, the smaller the dispersion of the solution space. So what I mean by that is, you know, like in a system like the larval zebrafish, we have between 10,000 to 40,000 neurons, which means that we're building very large networks. Um, so there the dispersion or the sensitivity to initial conditions is much less uh, than in a system like the macaque or the human, where there will be sensitivity to, you know, initial choices and like that. Two, we're simplifying away a lot of the complexity of real biology, like the influence of glial cells, like other cell types, like neuromodulatory influence. What we're capturing is the matrix of connectivity that gives you the full dynamical system. So it is better than the correlation matrix um, from the outputs, but it is not capturing the full dynamics, right? So for so it's the full complexity, which means we're, we could be inferring indirect or disynaptic interactions or even neuromodulatory influences as, uh, as, as a direct connection. So yes and no is the answer to your question. Okay, let's, uh, next question is for you, Eric. Um, and does the model work for, an independent, for independent gene networks? In an interdependent. Interdependent, yeah, you're right. That, that's why I didn't understand the question. In a network system, how would you define noise? Okay, so these are two different questions. So the, the answer to the first question is yes, to an extent, although we are sort of looking at what is the effect of adding one regulatory interaction at a time. So you're imagining the network is working in some way, and then you're saying, well, let's put an extra binding site that couples this gene to, an, to a regulator that exists in the, in the network. And depending on how that regulator behaves, and you know what the, the fitness what the fitness function is for the expressions of that gene across conditions. This will have now some effect uh, on the fitness of the of the genotype. So in that sense, it also works for networks. What do I mean with noise in a network context? I'm, I don't think I totally understand this question. Um, there is just cell to cell variability in the levels of transcription factors. And, and also just in the binding and unbinding, which is also stochastic, right? So there's thermal noise in the cells. All these molecules are doing Brownian motion. And so from- I, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I also don't know what the question was, but we could imagine the question being, how do you combine the noise of various genes into a fitness function? Ah. So basically, well, the assumption that, the, that we make here is that in a given environment, the, the global uh, sort of survival or you know, death rate and reproduction rate of a single cell is a multivariate uh, peak function of the gene expression levels of all the genes that it has. And so basically, if you assume that you can characterize each gene by sort of like an optimal level in this environment and the sort of uh, uh, standard deviation over which fitness is affected, um, then the, 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 the model goes through. Okay, thanks. Uh, our next question is for Hélène. When it comes to accessing diversity, is phylogeny more beneficial than functional characteristics of the species? Uh, yeah, so I guess it depends on the question that we are interested in, right? So if we're, so if we're interest, interested in understanding ecosystem function, obviously um, having functional characteristics of a species is going to be uh, more useful. And in this case, phylogeny sometimes has been used as a proxy when we cannot measure functional characteristics. Now, when we're interested um, in questions such as the one that I presented, more looking at um, past dynamics of diversity, then uh, this type of inference is done with phylogenetic data. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, so let's go back to Gautam. Uh, how much of a role learning from past experience is there? How, how much better does the animal get a tracking with experience? Do, can you incorporate this into your models? I mean, learning does matter, right? Like in the rat experiments, uh, they learn over days to do it well. Of course, you don't know if they're learning the task itself and not how to track. Um, but for dogs, for sure, right? Like uh, veteran trail tracking dogs are much, much better than they want. Um, incorporating into models is quite hard. 
because when you're training a reinforcement learning model, I mean, it, it is a learning process, but it may not really reflect uh, how the animal actually learns. So maybe might- I have a follow-up here. I mean, when, you know, you're giving these examples and is it more, I mean, is it just long-term learning from like one experience to the other? Or is it also the short-term learning that happened a few seconds ago in the same trial that matters? Do we know that? Um, in the kind of, in the, sec, in the trail tracking, both matter, um, because the learning within a trial is about like eliminating where the paths are, uh, whereas learning across trials would be, how do you search for eliminate the different paths, um, over a long period. Okay. Thanks. So next question for Kanaka. Would you comment on how you plan to perturb the patterns you see? These regions have a mix of cell types at many levels, including the simplest one, which is a mix of excitatory versus inhibitory cells. I know you can do it ontogenetic. I think uh, this was, yeah, of optogenetically, optogenetically, optogenetically yeah. right? But how do you know what cells to target? Uh, tricky question. I don't know, honestly, at this point. So the one thing we can make a prediction for is blocking feedback from all cells um, into the RAFE um, or all RAFE units projecting into the habenula. The advantage of using this kind of current-based decomposition is that the matrix comes with positive and negative elements. So rather than me putting in cell types up front, we can infer the excitation versus inhibition currents from just looking at the model fits. And they don't necessarily have to be symmetric. The matrix doesn't have to turn out to be symmetric. So we're waiting for the, so this was a zeroth order exercise for us to see what the model spits out first in a highly constrained system. And then design experiments and add more more, um, complexity in terms of sparse inter-area connectivity, excitatory and inhibitory cells and so forth. Uh, The third uh, point to this is that we have fish that do not lapse into um, passivity because they have been exposed to ketamine. So in those fish, the prediction, if I am right about this, the prediction is that the RAFE2 habenular backward going current is indeed um, eliminated. And that's something that we do find. But as you had asked in your first question, I imagine it's that um, it's that we're inferring indirect connections also as potentially direct connections. So uh, given the works of biology, um, I think we have a powerful method on our hands. Okay, I think we're going to be cut right now. This, uh, okay, yeah, there's we'll... more questions coming in for everybody. So, uh, okay, there's also a very broad question for Eric uh, about evolutionary explanations and asking how does drift come into this and how was drift uh, as an explanation of the experiment rejected? Is oh, there a short okay. answer? Thank you for whoever asked that, because um, I guess it it didn't come across that the whole uh, development of theory started from the fact that we observed that if you take a random sequences that express, but have not been selected for their noise properties, then they are systematically low noise and lower noise than many, many native promoters. So that means under drift alone, noise would go away. Okay, you need some explanation for where, why the noise in the native promoters went up. And uh, then we found that what characterizes these high noisy native promoters is that they have many regulatory inputs. And so then the question is, okay, why would that be? And um, basically all that the model shows is uh, if you combine noise propagation with the effects of the regulators, what would be the effects on uh, fitness? So it's not that we're sort of want to make up an evolutionary explanation that involves potential benefits. We're forced to do this. Okay, thanks. And last question for Ellen. Uh, there is there an expected diversity scaling law for different species? 
Uh, okay, so if I understand well the question, there is a, a scaling law along the body size axis, whereas um, a small bodied species are going to be more diverse than um, large bodied one, and there is a diversity scaling law for this uh, relationship. Um, I don't know of any scaling law with um, diversification rates, so like the, the type of um, uh, processes that I talked about for explaining differences in species richness across, um, across species groups. Okay, great. Thank you. So thank you again to all the speakers. Thank you for everybody for your wonderful questions. Uh, and uh, if you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out and see you next time. And thank you to the staff for organizing this. All right. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Very Thank much. You very Thank much. much, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.